Yeah! Woo! We're one! We are one, y'all! That is crazy! Can you imagine? We planted our church, right? Uh, 227 people showed up that day. Like, we had a, like a party. It was awesome. We celebrated. And then two weeks later, um, we have to close in-person uh, celebrations, right? Our, our worship celebrations were closed in person, but we figured out how to go online and all year we went online until like maybe what close to Christmas or, or sometime last year. I don't know, but we are officially one. Like we've planted a church in a pandemic. Can you give it up? Yes. The Lord is good. Y'all we have officially made it and I'm extremely thankful. Like I really am. Um, I think we've just you got to continue to make an impact uh, in our community in Fredericksburg. We got to continue to make an uh, impact of people in, in other places. Like, we just got to continue to tell people about Jesus because that's the reason why we plant, right? Because we want people that don't have freedom to have freedom. We want people that don't have purpose to have purpose. And we just want people to be satisfied, people to just to have this fulfillment, y'all, right? So um, we're one. Let's continue to continue to grow. Let's continue to go. Let's continue to reach people um, and let them know. I feel like I should be a rapper or something. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you're new to the Bridge Church, welcome. We're glad that you are here. We're glad that you're a guest. In the comments, there should be a link that will tell you about the Connect card. You can fill that out. And we give gifts. So you will receive a gift from us uh, when you fill out that uh, connect card. It just helps us to get to, to know you. It, you can let us know how we can pray for you and how we can serve you and how we can be a bridge to you uh, so that you can also have freedom, purpose, and fulfillment. We have started this new series called Make Way for the King. As we look at the Gospel of John, Gospel just means good news, and it's good news about Jesus, what he has really done for us in our life, that he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, he's the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And so um, our message is that we just want people to know Jesus. Uh, we want people to know Jesus so they can have uh, salvation, what that means, so they can be saved, uh, so they can uh, have freedom, purpose, and fulfillment is what we call it, so they can just um, have a relationship with him because a relationship with anything else will fail you. It will lead to death. But a relationship with Christ will give you life. And so um, we get to celebrate Jesus today at our one year. The second reason uh, that we're going through John is there is a people group called the Gabori people uh, who don't have the Bible. And so um, the, the, are we have partnered with an organization called Wycliffe. Uh, to where every connect card that we receive, we give a dollar uh, to this organization. And what they're doing right now is they're translating um, the Gospel of John in their language so that uh, they can have uh, the Bible, so they can have the Gospel of John. And we know throughout this Gospel, it teaches us who the Messiah, who the King really is, and what he comes to do. Last week, we saw an awesome miracle, right, where he changed water to wine. We saw his authority. We saw that we should have faith and trust in him. And this week, we get to see a side of Jesus um, where he just, again, shows his authority. Um, but we see uh, some of his anger, uh, anger, but don't sin, right? Anger is okay, but don't sin through it. And we see how uh, he, he wants to kind of cleanse some things, put things back in order. But I'm pumped to go through this with you. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and get your Bible and turn to John chapter 2 uh, as we kick it off in verse 13 that says this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus, he went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple courts, he found people selling um, cattle, sheep, doves. Y'all, this is inside the temple courts. He's finding people selling things um, that shouldn't be sold. And it says, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So this is what he did. He made a whip out of cords and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned tables to those who sold doves, he said. Get these out of here. So to those who were selling doves, he's like, get these doves out of here. Stop turning my father's house 
into a market. Let's pray and let's dive deep of what's really going on. God, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for your word and thank you for always guiding us and leading us. Lord, I just pray uh, that you just continue to use our church, that we'll be a bridge to people that don't know you, that I know that there are broken relationships, broken marriages, people are just hurt, people are just falling, people are just in need of you, God. And so my hope is that through this message, you'll speak through me as you always do, and that you will just guide people to have a true and genuine relationship with you. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so like that took a turn, right? Like that was crazy what just happened. Jesus comes on the scene. He comes into the temple. People are selling all kinds of stuff. It's supposed to be a place of worship. And then Jesus finds these cords on the ground. He starts whipping things back in shape. And so let me just give you some background history, some information. Um, in the temple, uh, the temple uh, was built. Um, really, we can see all that, see all of that through the Old Testament. Uh, but it was built for God to really dwell with his people. And so what you'll find that happens in the temple is sacrifices. That people would sacrifice lambs uh, to God he, that because um, they wanted God to forgive them for their sins. And so they would, they would sacrifice these lambs to him. But let me just say this too. Um, this wasn't to save them. Right, like this wasn't sacrificing some kind of animal, wasn't there to save them, it wasn't there to make them right before the Lord. Really, what this did, God wanted them to see how much disobedience, how much sin that they would commit towards Him. And so there would be so many animals sacrificed, and there'd be so much blood that is shed for their viewing to see that they needed a savior, that they needed a God. Because those animals, honestly, they wouldn't have done anything. This temple is supposed to also be just this holy place made for true worship. They're offering their worship to God. This is what is supposed to happen. So in verse 13, it says, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And so let me explain the Jewish Passover real quick for maybe some of you that may not know this. Um... Uh, the Jews were slaves in Egypt, and Jesus wanted uh, to, his people to be free. And so basically what he did, he did these, um, these miracles, these things to kind of help the Pharaoh that had them captivated or, or had them captivated, had them captured, uh, had them slaves. Um, and so he did these things to, uh, to have his people free. And Pharaoh, he just wouldn't listen. So at the last one, God basically said, um, um, sacrifice a lamb. And place the blood of a lamb on your doorpost. This way it tells the angel to pass your door and go to the ones where it doesn't have the blood of the lamb there. And basically what would happen, the firstborn son would be killed in those households that didn't have the blood of the lamb. And so the, the Jews, they celebrate this Passover because this ultimately freed them. But not only that. This was also God showing them that one day the Lamb of God was going to free them from the bondage of sin. And so they would go and celebrate the Passover to celebrate like, man, we are free. Like we get to have freedom, although in some ways they were still in bondage uh, to the Romans. But this was a holiday that they would just come and celebrate. So now back to the temple, they would come to uh, when they're celebrating uh, Passover, they would come to this this temple. And there would be people all over the world that would try to come and worship God on this special on this special uh, day. And so if you were not a Jew, you were not allowed to go to a certain place of the temple. You would have to be in the temple courts. And so what was happening in the temple courts were people were selling, just like we read, like donkeys and, and all these things were going on there. It, it probably looked awful. In fact, in verse 14, it says this was happening. He found Jesus, people selling cattle, people selling sheep and doves and others sitting at the tables exchanging money so this place of worship um by the way do you guys like my christmas tree <laughs> i still have my christmas tree up uh, I, I was supposed to say something at the beginning but i'm just like hey I, oh yeah my christmas tree yeah we still celebrate christmas all year round this is our celebration um anyway so uh in verse 14 in the temple courts he found people selling 
cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So it would have looked like a flea market. It would have been loud. It would have smelled like a zoo or a farm. Just think about that when people are trying to come to God and worship him. You know, it would have been, it would have been crazy. It would have been hard to do. I mean, just the smell gives distractions, right? We'll be in the car driving, the windows rolled up, and we'll pass a farm like, ugh, what is that smell? Like Lily and Megan try to blame it on me. I mean, it might be me, I don't know. Uh, but, but like it's a huge distraction for them to actually get their, uh, their worship on. They can't really praise Jesus. It's, it's loud and it smells bad. And not only that, there's probably robbery, thieving, that is going on inside this temple. The sacrifice of a lamb in the Old Testament law, it, it said that the lamb needed to be without blemish, that there needed to be nothing wrong with it, um, which again points back to Christ. Like Jesus was perfect here. Like he lived or everywhere. He was perfect. He is perfect. And he died on a cross. He was sacrificed for you. So this lamb needed to be perfect essentially. Like without blemish, the Bible says. And so when you had people travel from far ways, maybe like Galilee, which is probably 90 miles away from Jerusalem, like something's probably going to happen to their animal. Um, and so they would have animals there at the market. But this is what would happen. Even if the people live like extremely close, uh, they would lie or say like, hey, yeah, we're not accepting your lamb. You need to go buy one. Even if they bought the lamb or, or, or the animal or whatever it was just right outside the temple gate. So they just used this to make more money. It was robbery going on uh, in this temple. There's also temple tax um, in place. Uh, and they would charge extra money during times like the Passover. That's supposed to be an awesome celebration to come and worship God. They were just destroying a place that is meant to be holy, a place that is meant for worship, and using it as a place just to make money. Using it as a, as a place to lie and to thieve. And over time, this place was becoming more like a business. The Jews became more hungry for money and began to lose their taste for holiness. That's what began to happen. See, church for them just became ritual. We never want church to become ritual, y'all. Like every Sunday, we want to offer our worship to him. Like sacrificing to God, like those things were just a ritual. It became numb to them. Like they didn't really care about it. They just did it because they had to do it. They were not humble. They lost sight of God. It wasn't true worship. The hearts of the Jews had just corrupted the temple and distracted others from worshiping this one true God. They had lost their wonder for Jesus. Honestly, they were really excited for the Messiah to come back. Like they knew that God was going to come back someday. They were excited for him to come back. But they thought it was to put fear in their oppressors. They thought it was to put Israel back on top again. But really he came that day to whip that temple back in shape. He came to make, um, uh, make things new. He came to point people back to the right direction. He came to make you holy. Jesus, he came to give you freedom. He came, to, to, uh, he came for the poor in spirit. He came for the widow. He came for the broken. He came for the sick. He came for the sinners to point you to a new way of life. He came for everyone, not just for the Jews. He wants to point you to a way that is going to truly satisfy, not just you, but also bring it will it will satisfy him. It will please him. So basically, what happened is Jesus finding these cords. These cords were probably there from people bringing their animals or um, from the animals being locked up in their cages that probably came from the cords. Um, which kind of we know in, in Genesis, it tells us that he is really good at creating things, right? And so he creates these cords out of nothing. He makes this whip out of cords, right? And, and he drove, it says, verse, verse 15 says, so he made a whip out of cords and he, he drove it all from the temple courts, both sheep 
and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. See, Jesus came to cleanse the temple. And a lot of theologians today, they call this honestly a miracle. And when I'm reading this, man, I'm, I'm thinking like, whoa, like how is this a miracle? Like I got to see the background. I got to see like what makes this a miracle because it's not like the, the water to wine or, or healing a leper. But like when reading this, it holds a lot of weight. In this miracle that scholars call it, it's a, it's a miracle that holds a lot of authority. See, history says that there should have been about two and a million or two and a quarter million of people that were in and out of that temple. But that day would have probably been tens of thousands plus people at a time. So you got to catch this visual. Jesus rolls in. He walks in the temple. He sees all this corruption going on, all this sin, all this disgrace. And here are these cords that are just on the ground, probably from people bringing in animals. And then tens of thousands of plus people are driven out. From these temple courts. Now these aren't like billions of men. Like this isn't an army that's doing this. This is one man that's driving out everything. People and animals are leaving with urgency because there's one man with the whip cleansing his father's temple. You would think even if you had some just this jack dude, someone like me, right, could to probably come in there and try to stop him. Or even just like a gang of people to try to stop him and, and to calm things down. Like you would think something like that, some kind of security or, or priest. I mean, Jesus was an unknown man at that time. But you could see his authority was there. I mean, they didn't stop him. Now, if I'm honest with you, I believe the Jews realized what they had done. And they possibly seen the authority that Jesus had. I mean, you got to see it. This guy is just flipping over tables. Money is going everywhere. People don't know. They don't know Jesus yet. They don't know who this man is. And people aren't doing anything. Jesus is unleashing miracle power. Power. The miracle is he drove them all out of the temple. There is no lightning. There is no ground shaking. He just drove them all out. This was divine fury towards hypocritical worship. It seems like he drove them out in such an orderly fashion that the guards didn't even attack the crowds. No instruction in scripture says that anyone was injured or hurt. Jesus does not harm people, but he specifically goes after the religious system. Like he specifically attacks this religious system. And this is a preview of just Jesus's judgment that he has authority to do so. He's like, stop turning my father's house into a market. Jews didn't really speak like that either. They didn't use the word like father when it came to, to God. Like they wouldn't do that. In fact, John 15, 17 through 18 says, Jesus says, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus, in this text, he's just showing his authority. You may not think that it's a big deal, but this behavior was abnormal in the temple. It wasn't abnormal in the temple. Like things like this could, could happen all the time. In fact, there's historical evidence that on one occasion, the high priest was in the temple and, and the Jews were very upset with the high priest. And so they, just, they start chucking lemons at him. They're throwing lemons at the high priest. And you know what the high priest does? He unleashes his private mercenaries, his own army, and they slaughtered people in the courtyard to the multiple thousands, it says. They did not play around with temple worship. They didn't play around with that. 
And so when Jesus is coming in with his whip and, and flipping tables and, and coins are flying everywhere, like, like the, the priest would have probably, he should have come out there and, and, and caused some kind of chaos. But he did it because he saw that Jesus, there's something different about him, that he holds something different. He is bucking the system. And so in verse 17, it says, his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples remembered a song in Psalm 69 that points to David's plea to save him. And you see God's authority to do so. And so I know I haven't given you the big idea yet. So I want to go ahead and give it to you now. The big idea is this. Have zeal for the temple. Have zeal for the temple. Zeal just means to have passion or enthusiasm while being in pursuit of a cause. Synonyms are devotion or, or love and eagerness. Why is this so important? Because not only did Jesus have this for God's temple, to shut down religious systems, but he has zeal for you. He has zeal for you. He has passion for you, enthusiasm, while being in pursuit of you. He has devotion towards you. He has love towards you. He's eager to, to give you freedom and joy and love and purpose. He has zeal towards you. See, you are made to be in perfect union with God that you are even more valuable than this temple. And let me, tell, let me be honest with you. We found ourselves running from God, separating ourselves from God, isolating ourselves from God. We've tried to drown out God. We've tried to suppress his words and even, and even make our, our own selves God. Like we, we honestly, we know what's best for ourselves. We are better than anything else. Like we've tried to make ourselves God and we want what we want. We try to find joy in things that don't really satisfy. We will neglect God who is for us and wants the best for us. We've lied and we've stolen and we murdered and we covet. And you say, Chris, I thought this was a self Celebration. Like you're making me feel down. Like because it's so true. We are falling, y'all. Like we are depraved. We are sick. We are lost. We are in bondage. Or were if you're a Christian. See, number one, our temples are in need of Jesus. Our temples are in need of Jesus. See, we'll try to turn to things that just just make us feel good, not getting to the root of our problem. See, I'm not Jesus, y'all, but can I cleanse the temple today? See, we don't want to be religious. We want relationships. We don't want to judge people and create barriers for people to know Christ. We don't want to just show up to church to get our fixing. See, Jesus, he isn't your genie. He will be your savior if you let him. Church isn't just a Sunday thing. It should be an everyday thing. Don't be holier than now on Sunday. And then through the week, you're a different person. Can I cleanse the temple today? See, don't make it a religion to where you never come to church except for special holidays. Like the Passover. Or like the bridge turning one. Or like Easter. Like, hey, let's see you tomorrow and on Easter. I come to worship every Sunday, plug in, be involved. Can I cleanse the temple today? Like, what are you placing in front of Jesus? What are you putting on authority in, in front of Jesus? Is it money like the Jews? Is it pride like the Jews? Is it the American dream that will one day fade away? Is it your job? Can I cleanse the temple? Who has authority in your life? Is it sports? Is it family? Is it addictions? Can I cleanse the temple? See, we are fallen. And we deserve the wrath of God. And here's the deal. God doesn't send us there. Like you hear people say, you know, why does God, why does a loving God send people to hell? Well, it's not that at all. See, we were already headed there in the first place. It's kind of like a, a ship, like the Titanic. 
It hit that iceberg. And it just becomes falling. And if people were to stay on the Titanic, and some people did, they would have, they would have drowned, and some people drowned. But see, here's the deal. The Father sends Jesus as your lifeboat. And it's up to you to jump off this sinking boat and to grab hold to Jesus, to get on board with Jesus. Because he's the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. We were headed towards death. And it's Jesus that wants to give you life. You just have to start a relationship with him and allow him to cleanse you. Verse 18. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them. And, and like it's, it's, it's really weird, right? Like he, he has the authority to clear all the temple. Like he's already cleared it. And usually don't even ask questions, right? We saw earlier, they just... Sent, he's just sent his army to start killing people. But here, he actually asks. Like, they, they're asking, what sign? Like, how do you have authority? And Jesus answered them this way. Destroy this temple, and I'm going to raise it again in three days. And they replied, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple. In fact, they were still building it. And he's like, you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he raised, uh, after he was raised from the dead, the disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See the miracle. My alarm went off. The miracle, <laughs> the miracle was right in front of them. They wanted him to do something then and there. But hold on a second. Because a lot of times we want Jesus to do things in our lives then and there. Can I just tell you that Jesus has the ultimate authority and he's in control. He can do things when and whenever he wants to. We don't control him. He leads us and we have to trust and rely on him to do that. And he tells them what will happen. He's like, in the future, this is what's going to happen. You, you are going to tear this temple down, and I'm going to raise it up. And that is the good news. That is the gospel. That is why we celebrate today. That when we deserve death, Jesus became man by giving up some privileges so that he could die for you. This means he, he needed to live a perfect life, and the wrath, the wrath that we deserve is placed on him. And when he died and conquered death and resurrected from the grave, it brought us life. It shows that if we trust in him, he gives us the power to conquer any of our problems that we have. And then one day, you get no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. Verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all, be, all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. This holds truth today. People can tell you all day that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is God. But what does their heart say? What does your heart say? What does your action proclaim? Does your actions proclaim you to be a follower of Jesus? Number two, our temple should be a place where God dwells. Our temple should be a place where God dwells. When we struggle with depravity or our fallen nature, we have the Holy Spirit, Jesus' Spirit, who to help us to stay on track, to help us to look more and more like Jesus. We start living a life that wants to please Jesus, where God has taken over our temple, and we are being transformed to have a godly temple with godly motives and a godly mindset. Your life begins to change for the better. Your life begins to change for the better. God is cleaning your temple. Your marriage, it starts to look different. Relationships start to look different. 
you begin to start reaching out to God for wisdom. You start to notice your sin. And you, just, you just start to hate it. You become more forgiving because God forgave you. You have more freedom. It's like a weight has just lifted off your shoulders. You walk in life. Your walk in life begins to start looking different. You have a purpose now. You also begin to care for what people cares for. What did Jesus care for? You begin to start caring for what Jesus cared for. What does Jesus care for? I mean, let's look at his miracles. He changed water to wine. He healed a paralytic man. A man couldn't walk. He helped them walk. He healed the blind so the blind could see. He raised a man like Lazarus from the dead. During a nap, he was woken up to calm storms and, and the winds and the waves, and he did that. What we see from Jesus is that he cares for people. That we have to be a people that cares for people. That God molds us to care for people. That we become the hands and feet of Jesus. See, Christians have always been the front lines to give Jesus. We've built hospitals. We've built schools. We've served the sick. And we should never stop. Even during a pandemic, right? Like we shouldn't be hiding in our homes. This is a time to allow God to use you. This isn't a time for the doors to be closed. This is a time to be open. This isn't a time to, to shun out our neighbors. It's time to build relationships. God has a heart for people. God wants the best for people. So we should have that same heart too. Are you compassionate? Are you being a bridge? See, we are not to be complacent. We are to help people to find life. And so maybe you're here today and you've realized, man, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to whip me back in shape. Well, Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you can be saved. It's that simple. And then he begins to start transforming you to look more and more like him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for your word and your guidance, Lord. Thank you for leading us and using us, Lord. I just pray that you just cleanse our temple, that we can be just be, be on fire for you. God, our church is one. We are one now. And so help us to not um, to dwell on the past, but help us to just, to just be in your presence always. As we're running towards the future to reach people that don't know you. And that if there are people in this that are watching this live stream that don't have a relationship with you, Lord, I just pray that they give their hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes! We are one. Look, if that was you today that gave your life or that wants to give your life to Christ, fill out that connect card. Um, it'll show you what you want to do, and we can walk you through those steps. Y'all, we are one. We have made it. Let's continue to be a bridge in our community. Clear eyes. Full hearts, can't lose. One, two, three, be a bridge.